Good morning, everyone. I'm Arlene Winsborough, Manager, Service Excellence. On behalf of the Service Excellence team, welcome to Client Feedback Next Level. Today's session is for teams who've started gathering feedback and want to gain a deeper understanding of how to progress their work, as well as for those who are looking ahead and want to see what their future client feedback landscape could look like. During the session, please keep your sound muted and your camera off, except for when you're working together in a breakout room. We are recording this session so we can send you the link for future viewing and we'll include the, side, the slides. Our session leader today is Kyle Couch, founder and CEO of Spectrum Organizational Development. Welcome, Kyle. Hey, Arlene, thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Fantastic. So Kyle is a true champion of client feedback and we're very pleased to have him share his insights with you today. Take it away, Kyle. Thanks, Arlene. All right, everyone's here. I hope everyone can see me. And uh, obviously, hopefully, most importantly, you guys can hear me. Um, we're going to be talking for about 120 minutes about feedback. We had a great session yesterday. So for those of you who attended, I'm going to do a bit of a recap. Those of you who missed yesterday's session or uh, didn't uh, attend for a variety of reasons, I'm going to, again, do a bit of recap so we're all on the same page and make sure we understand exactly what it is uh, was, was discussed yesterday and how it kind of relates a bit more to today. But today is obviously in a, a bit more of an advanced session. Uh, and obviously, I want to make sure everyone understands what's happening. So we do have a chat feature here. Um, a lot of people are starting to kind of put some words in there, which is great. So if you want me to slow down, uh, expand on a point, have a question, by all means, put it in the chat feature. I'm happy to kind of pause and kind of recap on things because uh, we uh, have to move at a bit of a clip here um, because we only have two hours. Uh, there is going to be a longer Q&A session at the end. So uh, if your question isn't kind of a burning issue has to be answered right here, right now, let's save it to the end so we can make sure we get through most of the content. Also at the end of today's session, there is feedback forms because we're talking feedback. Why not do some feedback about today's session? So when we get to the end of the session, please take a moment to fill out those questions. The link will be provided at the end of today's session. Uh, that, that feedback is valuable to make sure that the service excellence team can bring you uh, kind of the training and development uh, opportunities you may need. So uh, lots of things to cover this morning. And, uh, Obviously, let's get right at it. The first thing I want to do is kind of launch out a bit of a poll, just get a sense on kind of because some of you have started the feedback process to this point, um, I want to kind of get a sense on how is it going? Um, if you haven't done any, you can obviously abstain from this poll for now. Um, but for those of you who have done uh, some, uh, some information at this point, I am launching out a poll. So take a moment and uh, fill out some of the sessions, some of the questions that, uh, that make sense for you, please. Lots of good feedback coming in. So if you haven't uh, taken an opportunity, by all means, uh, put some in here. Hey, good morning, Daniel, how are you? Um, make sure you get your uh, feedback in. I'm gonna close the poll in a moment or two here, but just wanna make sure everyone's in. Uh, things are slowing down. So I'm going to just kind of wait for another, Oop, things are still moving slightly. See if we can get everybody in here. All right, we're gonna pause there just to get an idea on how we are. So I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share some results here. Uh, <laughs> I used a term yesterday that apparently no one else has heard. I hope that obviously you guys are not appling for the teacher. Uh, I know that feedback is a very helpful tool and I, I do uh, at, you know, truly believe that you, most of you feel that it is a helpful uh, tool as well. So by looking at these results, you can clearly see that uh, for those of you who are, most of you who are doing it, uh, you're finding it helpful, but it is kind of re refreshing to see. And just because feedback is a scary thing at times that it can be, you know, a little bit cumbersome, um, you know, a little bit embarrassing at times. Um, I'm a little uh, scared. I don't know what the word is around people that find it meaningless. And I think that hopefully as you start to kind of iterate this a little bit more often, you'll be able to see that uh, this does bring some tremendous value. And uh, I'm very uh, excited to talk a bit more about that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put on some slides. We're gonna talk about some things. Uh, obviously, like I said, use the chat feature because that's a, a very, very helpful thing. Um, to make sure I know what's going on here. And I just wanna make sure we go through some things. So obviously we talked a bit about your experience with feedback and I know that it's not been many years you've been doing feedback. So obviously it's gonna be a bit of a challenge and you kind of can maybe some stumbling out of the gate. You might get some feedback you weren't prepared for those sorts of things. So just stick with it, give it some time. And obviously as you work through with the service excellence team you'll get a better handle on how to use feedback more effectively. And hopefully in the next hour, uh, almost two hours now we're gonna be talking about these sorts of things and hopefully it helps you out. 
Uh, who am I? Why am I doing this? <laughs> First and foremost, uh, I'm not a TDSB employee. Uh, I was a TDSB student uh, way back when, back in the olden days. Um, <laughs> but anyways, but for the past 20 years or so, I've been working on feedback in a variety of uh, uh, organizations and, and industries. So what I've done, everything from employee surveys to customer surveys, uh, internal surveys around 360 feedback, performance management. I've done onboarding surveys and exit interviews. I've worked with organizations around launching new products. So I've been asking questions to a lot of different people for a very long time. And I can see how it helps my client organizations. And I know that the more these internal service teams at the TDSB uh, start to work on this sort of process, you'll be amazed at how much it helps you raise your game in terms of delivering your service in the most excellent manner possible. So I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, just a quick, uh, kind of a very, very high level. Yesterday's session was for groups that hadn't taken the steps that many of you had. It was about kind of finding yourself on the map. And the thing I like to tell all my clients often is guessing is a terrible way to run a business. So what I say is you better get some feedback metrics in to figure out how you're doing. So what we talked about yesterday was establishing kind of those coordinates to figure out are you doing a great job? Are you not so great job? And what is the room for improvement? So that that's kind of was the focus of yesterday was getting people into the process. But for many of you, this is not a new thing. And what I want to be talking about today is kind of using that and making it more kind of a GPS. So you know where you are on the map. Hopefully you're starting to get a sense on where you want to go and using feedback to help you get there. So that's kind of what we want to talk about today. It's how you take feedback from kind of a static data set and make it more of a living document. So we're going to talk about that the, for the balance of today's session. But what I want to start off by doing is kind of giving a bit of a recap of what we talked about yesterday. So everyone's on a level playing field. And just a couple of slides to give you an idea. So the agenda was pretty uh, introductory as per the session itself. We talked about how to embrace feedback. So for a lot of these service teams and a lot of organizations that I've dealt with over my career, uh, this could be a scary thing. The first time you're getting feedback in on how you're doing, it's not how you feel you're doing, but it's maybe how your customers and clients feel you're doing. So we talked about kind of the emotions and expectations around embracing feedback. Then we started to shift gears on how do you actually do this? How do you collect feedback? So we talked about the different types of feedback mechanisms, and we're going to talk about more of those today. We also talked about how to structure questions and rating scales. This is pretty interesting things. And then the last part of yesterday's session was around kind of how do you use that feedback? Now you've got all these data points. What do you do with them? So we talked about things about how to kind of organize, organize them and structure them, build action plans, and actually make the change required, which is the whole point of doing this feedback process in the first place. So we had some pretty high level things. We, we talked at a, at, a, at a very, at the beginning of yesterday's session that there are kind of two streams that you're gonna get from when it comes to feedback. There's gonna be solicited feedback. So i.e. some of these things, and I've been sent a list from the Service Excellence team on uh, the variety of different kind of tools that have already been in place at the TDSB through some of your groups on how you're collecting feedback at this point. So that would be along the solicited side, but there's a whole bunch of unsolicited feedback that you may have received over the course of your career where all of a sudden you pick up the phone and it's somebody that's ready to kind of give you an earful on how your uh, service has not lived up to their expectations or they're struggling and all those sorts of things. So what we wanna do is figure out ways of turning as much as of the feedback into a solicited form so that you can control how feedback comes to you and you can kind of quantify it more effectively to, uh, to make the great changes that are required as we go along here. Um, we went over this kind of a basic thing. A lot of organizations don't understand kind of what feedback is and they think it's just a complaint system. But what I like to argue is that there are kind of these five C's of feedback. So you're gonna get some compliments if you deserve them. Obviously you're gonna get some negative complaints if things don't live up to your client's expectations. Not even your expectations, you have to realize that they have a bit more power these days. So if they don't like it, they're going to tell you about it. You'll get some neutral comments and just people saying, yes, it did what it was expected to do and that's just fine. And then what we wanna work on, and we're gonna talk in a bit greater detail today are these kind of more uh, partnership uh, forms of feedback where people that you know out there, your more trusted users, your heavy users, those sorts of things, they're gonna voice their concerns. They're gonna get ahead of some issues and kind of sit down with you, get you on the phone and, and explain maybe how what you're doing may can be tweaked and, and, and improved upon to help you and them and all the other users uh, deal with things more effectively. And the last piece is this piece around counsel where they can, you, know, you can have a conversation with people where it's not really directed at one particular thing, but they can um, help you through your struggling. They can help you through some of your issues. And, and those are some of the major, major feedback pieces that I wanna kind of focus a bit on this morning as we talk about things. 
Feedback is a wonderful tool. However, there is your view of the world and there is your client's view of the world. And what hopefully you can accomplish by administering more feedback between yourselves and your clients is kind of closing this gap between perception and reality. So the better you are at asking questions, the more effective you are at interpreting results, the more and the more able you are to make the changes that your, uh, that your clients are looking for, you'll be able to close that gap a bit more and, and kind of realize that how you see the world and how they see the world is, is actually quite close and, and you can make uh, great strides once that gap is closed down effectively. We also talked about response rates yesterday, realizing everybody wants to get 100% participation. That's the goal and that's a wonderful goal to have, but study after study has shown that no matter how hard you try, you're not gonna get 100% most of the time. And depending even on what form of feedback tool you use, there are, there are varying degrees of effectiveness in terms of how many people uh, you're actually gonna get feedback from. So just keep that in mind. So don't get discouraged as you send out you know, a thousand emails and you only get 200 responses. That's, you know, many cases, that's actually a great response rate when there's nothing really to, to gain at this point. So we talked about that yesterday. This is where we wanna kind of start to transition from what we talked about yesterday now into today's actual session. When we deal with this kind of this feedback, um, uh, this feedback process, there are three major uh, phases of it. There is the listening phase. So that is where you're actually sending out the feedback tools, i.e. surveys or having focus groups and all those sorts of things. And then there's the understanding. Once you have the data back, now what, what does it say to you? And what, what do, how do you read those tea leaves more effectively? And then the last piece is the act. What do you do to then create the next listening opportunity to keep building your game up and up and up? So yesterday we talked about some of the things in that first line, but today what I want to be talking more about is some of the more complex tools you might be able to use, the varied application of, of those tools, realizing that it's not an annual process, the better you get at this. It could be looking at data in real time, thin slicing results to get an idea of maybe where some of your pockets, uh, your, some of your gaps may lie. And then obviously when it comes to acting, you want to realize that a lot of the feedback you may have been doing from, from at this point, maybe kind of uh, retrospective, things you have done with your clients, and there's a, a potential to turn it towards a more forward-looking approach and, and more segmented. So those are kind of how we're going to talk about things. So today, client feedback, the next level. Three major agenda items as we go through for the next hour and 15 minutes. First and foremost, we're going to talk about initiating feedback, understanding that it's not uh, it, it, it's great as a passive tool, but it can be so much more effective if you turn the focus around to asking for feedback more uh, effectively and, and more vociferously so that you can actually get feedback from different people and being a little more proactive on things. Then we're going to talk about analyzing the feedback, realizing that you're going to get all this feedback information sent back to you. You're going to get anecdotal comments. You're going to get pictures, all sorts of different things that we'll talk about today. Now, what do you kind of how do you see that as a kind of a moment in time and over a period of time? And the last piece we're gonna talk about today is targeting feedback, realizing the board's a big place, the city's a very big place. How do you kind of look at different pockets and target your feedback to the appropriate groups or, or uh, regions to ensure that you're getting the feedback you need so you can deliver your service the most effectively possible. So those are the three major items we're gonna talk about today. And we're gonna have a couple of breakouts. So they're gonna be opportunity for you to talk and kind of talk with some of your peers. So I'm really excited about some of the things we're gonna be doing over the next hour and 15 minutes. Section number one, let's talk about initiating feedback. Like I've said a bit in my intro, there is a past, a present and a future when it comes to the ability to ask for feedback. So a lot of the times you're asking for things that have already happened. And I think there are great opportunities, the better you get at asking for feedback and soliciting it from your clients and to make it a more past, present and future. So looking at things over a variety of different time frames will allow you to understand how your progress is, how your service group is making progress over time. And it's a major shift from kind of how did we do today? So when you get most surveys for uh, customer satisfaction and things like that in, in your lifetime, most of it is how did we do? How was our transaction? So a very, very past tense. And what I want more and more organizations to start seeing is what can we do for tomorrow? So understanding you can ask questions today that can be more forward looking and give you ideas to help you with your brainstorming to ensure that you can um, make changes, adapt on the fly, uh, start to be more innovative in how you deliver your services based on what your client's needs are. 
understanding that this proactive feedback is no longer about necessarily having your people or your clients rather point out problems, but more helping you expand the opportunities for the future. And that's such an, a helpful, helpful uh, tool to have because no longer is it just your group. Even if your group may be 100 employees, the board is significantly larger and, and that many more people providing feedback will allow you to, to kind of uh, hedge your bets on better information by more and more data points. So this, this feedback tool gets better the more you use it uh, as we go along. So we're, again, we're expanding the scope of feedback from just not just the service delivery in the past to the current struggles some of your clients may be facing and their future needs. So understanding this as a, as a full life cycle will allow your service team to be far more effective going forward. By having this larger view, this opens up a whole new toolbox of feedback mechanism. So up to this point, many of you have done quick phone surveys or um, uh, email links and things like that. And I, I feel there are so many more opportunities uh, based on some newer tools that are out there. So all sorts of what I'm going to call word-based tools. So going out and having interviews with people, interviewing your end user, like face-to-face, -face, having conversations with them, obviously when it's safe, might be a little more zoomy right now. Um, have them recall some of their accounts of, of how they've interacted with your particular service over time. Maybe have them uh, task them with, with keeping a diary for a day, a week, a month, that sort of thing over the course of a project to get a sense on not just specific questions you may have, but what, what were their emotions? What were some of the wins they had day by day? What were some of the major struggles they had? And you can track over the course of a project or a course of a um, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a season or whatever, a, a school year, uh, how they are dealing with you on a day to day basis. And you can look through those sorts of pieces of information to give them a, a deliver your service more effectively. You can have kind of more random group interviews. So having all sorts of people gather together either on Zoom or let's say someday in the future <laughs> in a room um, and, and ask them some kind of just generalized questions or have a more tailored focus group where you kind of cherry pick the people you want to have in the room and really kind of grill them and ask them great questions and have them uh, feedback, give you feedback that, that can help you raise your game. There are all sorts of observation tools. And this, this is something that a lot of organizations use. Uh, you know, a, a, something like a, a secret shopper is, is more of a retail example of this, but this is more just sitting back and watching the world unfold. So going on site to a school and, and watching how your process unfolds, just as an observer's perspective. So you can have a very structured view on how that happens. So understanding I wanna watch this room or I want to watch this hour every day for a week or have a more unstructured observation where you sort of wander around the school and just get a sense and, and the feel of the pace and maybe how you can impact uh, that school's uh, ability to function more effectively over time. Or, you know, people are, are, are uh, creatures of habit. So you might wanna pick a single person in, in a particular school and watch three or four of that role in different schools to watch how do they go about their day and understand maybe just by sitting there and shadowing them for the day, how do, you, how do they go about things and maybe how you can impact kind of that customer journey um, to ensure that your service hits the mark at the right time so that they can continue to be effective day in and day out. If you wanna step out a little bit further and realize without actually engaging your people, there are all sorts of different uh, means to gather feedback around what it is you do. So whether there are tests or studies or things that have been conducted, not just at the TDSB, but maybe throughout Canada or across North America, look at that sort of data. Um, there are all sorts of numerical statistics. You can benchmark against some other, um, uh, other organizations, uh, private sector, uh, uh, private schools, things like that to get a sense on how does the TDSB do things versus other uh, educational boards or, or schools or those sorts of things. And then there's other numerical data. And again, TDSB has done extensive amounts of studies and published many of the reports that are free for everyone to see. And gathering that data and looking at it through the lens of what it is you do can be very effective in helping you deliver your service more effectively. Yesterday, we had a great question. We were talking about just feedback in a general sense, and somebody brought up the concept of how do I conduct feedback over an 18 month period of, of in this case, uh, installing a new turf field at a particular school. And this is a great kind of moment to sit back and say, how do I um, observe, you know, like how do I collect feedback over a longitudinal study of 18 months and, and those sorts of things. But I thought, I thought about it since yesterday's session before today that there are so many other great chances to get feedback 
in and around this exact study. You can ask the last three schools that have had a, a turf field installed. How did it go? How did you feel in retrospect that we did in terms of our install? You can call three other boards and ask to go and talk to their people about how they installed their fields and, and is it working? You can do an observational study to sit back and say, are people actually using this field? Is it worth the time and effort? And there's all sorts of different ways of collecting feedback around that particular project, aside from the fact of every day from the first shovel in the ground till the first kickoff on that field, there's all sorts of data uh, points throughout that customer journey to decide um, when can I ask some great questions about how we're doing and how we can make this more effective. So there's, there, <laughs> there's so many great things happening at the TDSB that you, uh, as, a, as service teams, um, can sit back and say, how can we study this? What are some similar projects that have happened? How did we do noise level, cleanliness, all sorts of things. So this was a great question that was asked yesterday. And I wanted to show that there, there, there's a myriad of things. You can do some retrospect of other schools. You can do some present, go and study you know, what's happening at other schools. And then there's some future, looking at how many schools are gonna be asking for this in the future. Is this something that's on the rise? Is mowing the grass, you know, yesterday's news and now it's AstroTurf all day. Those sorts of things are great feedback tools that allow you to have a better client focus and be more effective in, in how you deliver your service day in and day out. So when it's safe to do so, um, obviously I strongly encourage people to get up from their desk and go on site to where your service is being used and get better data from looking at it, uh, asking people on site in the moment. That's a great way of taking your feedback to the next level. Um, when times are safe or do some online networking, whether through things like LinkedIn or virtual conferences, but talk to people, ask them questions about how they've approached similar projects. And those can be very effective conversations. But for the most part, I think a lot of those are gonna be Zoom right now, but don't let that slow you down. Because what I've seen in many organizations long before uh, coronavirus was that, you know, for example, for manufacturing clients where the team is global on re revamping a new process, They'll walk around with an iPad or uh, a webcam or things like that, and they will show the change to the machinery or to the production line in real time. Everyone can hear it, see it, ask questions, make fine adjustments, and move on that way. So don't wait for um, you know everyone to be vaccinated and everything. If there are people on site that can provide safe data through video analysis or just answering questions, engage them. That's a great tool, and I encourage you all to use it. When you are talking to these people, make sure you ask some great probing questions. Did you know we offer is a great question that a lot of uh, teams should ask far more op often because you may have a great skill set within your team and only this much of it is being used and you're wondering why no one else is engaging you on all these other things that your team offers. Well, maybe they don't know about it. They think of you as just this one little slice of, of the pie and figuring out how to, how to kind of advertise the other services your group offers. Would you be interested in? Involve them in a bit of the process about being more forward looking and helping you kind of craft your, your future strategy or ask them, listen, we do this day in and day out. What part of our service is most important to you? So you can really understand you do all these great things, but it's only this little piece that they love. And let's really focus on that and make sure we deliver it better and better every single day as we go along. This leads you, like I said at the beginning, to these more partnership level feedback uh, relationships. Understanding that you want people to come to you proactively with a concern, with some counsel to really understand who you are and how your team works. So these are people from the outside of your team, maybe some of your colleagues from inside of the team, but this is not just a, a kind of a, a nice compliment or just kind of a, a pointed complaint or a generalized, generalized comment. These are people that have kind of a, have skin in the game with you and are really kind of motivated to, uh, to help you grow over time. So there's this whole concept of actually building a partnership. So you're looking for having people that have a shared vision, some common goals, and really understand there's a mutual benefit to what you do and how they use it on the far end. And so making it better for them ultimately makes their life better. And it's just this reciprocal relationship. So interdependent performance driven relationships. If those are some things you can foster with the people that use your service day in and day out, you're gonna be ahead of the game all the time. So what I need you to do from now and, the, now and again is to look at the people you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and how you're getting feedback with and how do they see you? Do they see you as just a pure vendor? You're just giving them transactional 
items day in and day out? Or can you move your way up to a more partnership role where obviously you have a like, common purpose in what it is you deliver? They love hearing from you. They want your newsletter. They want to attend your meetings, those sorts of things. You know, do they have shared risk and reward? They understand that if you can't deliver your service, it impacts them. And if you don't engage their service, it impacts you. And that, that shared risk and reward is a beneficial piece when you start to have these feedback conversations. So the people see you as a partner, you alliance with them, and that makes uh, you know, allows feedback to flow at a very uh, quick pace, very honest and open. And obviously the, the process becomes far more collaborative. So people working together, and there, there's a bit of friction because Everyone wants to, to make things better over time. So it's, so it's a great status to have. And the further up that chain you can work, the better off you're going to be. So to, to build these great, strong relationships, obviously focus on the partnership, not just on the service delivery. Get to know the people who are, who are in, embracing your service and using it on a day-in and day-out basis to understand how does your service fit into the bigger role of what it is they do day in and day out. Cast the net a bit wider. Don't ask just a couple of people about what's going on expand on it, ask some of their, their frontline people, ask some of their more senior executives and kind of get a sense from a high level to a lower level, how does your service offering impact them and, and what do they think about what it is you do and how you work together. Think beyond anonymous surveys. A lot of times right now you're collecting surveys or information and it's, it's very much anonymized. So you have no idea who really said this, you just know somebody did. As you move up the partnership ladder, you can ask somebody to, that, that, that you have this sort of partnership relationship with and say, listen, I want your feedback. I want you to tell me to my face, how are we doing? And lastly, don't just wait till you know, the end of the year, ask them more often, ask them a couple of times a year. These people have a vested interest in your success as much as you have in their success. So they're not gonna get burned out with you asking them uh, about what it is you're doing on a far more often basis. So keep these partnership goals in line. You're going to get this open and honest feedback if you're able to provide these people with this concept of psychological safety. So understanding that if you can build the level of respect between you and the other person and you can grant them permission to say things at a more candid level, you're going to get that much more out of this relationship. So understanding you can move up this, 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 uh, this progression to this concept of a true challenger safety uh, level of safety where these people are literally able to say, this is terrible. <laughs> Don't go this route. And, 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 and you respect them for that because they are the ones ultimately using your service. So if you want great feedback, build these strong relationships and move up this ladder of respect and permission. Because this is the last thing that happens. You don't want the schools to go rogue. You don't want the schools to make up what it is you do on their own because they don't want to engage with you anymore. So understanding how important it is to build these sorts of relationships so that they reach out to you on a far more uh, frequent basis because they value what it is that you do. So think about this, how often this might be something that you measure is how often do schools go rogue on what it is you do? And the, the, the more you can kind of eliminate that sort of behavior and have them engage you 100% of the time, the more effective it's going to be for both you and the other person. So that's kind of what I want to talk about when we talk about initiating uh, feedback. What I wanna do is move on to our first breakout of the day. And I wanna give you a bit of an idea of how that's going to work. When you are broken out of these groups, I'm gonna send you randomly off into, into a group. Uh, I want you to select a scribe. Somebody who's gonna kind of keep the key points of what is being uh, talked about, uh, some questions that might be raised, um, some pain points, some concerns, whatever it is. And when we come back to the, the main group, they can add those sorts of uh, key points into the chat feature and we'll go through some of them, have a bit of a conversation. Uh, I'm going to give you about 15 minutes to discuss. Uh, we had uh, some feedback after yesterday's session that people wanted a bit more time to get into these conversations, which is a great thing. So I'm going to send you out in a moment um, to talk about how do you put data to use? So I'm going to send this back out, but for now, how effective is your unit team when it comes to putting the data you've collected to meaningful use? So before we start talking about analyzing the data, some of you had this experience. It's a great opportunity for the the service team members who are, are present today that maybe haven't even started to collect feedback to hear some of how does this, how is it going now that you've started it? So how effective is your unit team when it comes to putting the data you collected to meaningful use? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you off into your breakouts and I'll come back in about 15 minutes and uh, we'll have a bit of chat about it. So enjoy.
All right, so I'm, I'm assuming most people are back in now. Um, if there are scribes that are able to kind of put some of the things, uh, some of the key points you talked about into that, um, that chat feature, we will be good to not getting the expected feedback from clients. Huh. So not, and, and that can go a number of, of ways, not getting what you wanted to hear or not getting any feedback at all. So that, that's, a, that's a, a two very different things that happen from time to time. Uh, understanding that uh, people are, you know, you're gonna ask people and they just aren't gonna get back to you. And that's just part of this feedback game is realizing that um, you can ask, it doesn't mean people are going to, uh, to give you the feedback, uh, give you any feedback or the feedback you need. Um, and we're gonna talk a bit about you know, the feedback you want to get <laughs> and, and how that can be a kind of sort of a bad thing. So I want to see that. So um, it's good to hear that some people did some, some have implemented some new procedures and, and that that's, that's all we can hope for is that you get data. You can realize, gosh, we've, we've had kind of a, a blip in what it is we're doing. If we can kind of, kind of correct that, we can excel at what we're doing day in and day out. So that, that's great to hear for sure. Um, any of the other scribes have anything coming back in? So I've only got a couple of the groups have come back. Maybe you're typing frantically, uh, those sorts of things, which is fine. Um, but, oh, there we go. Yes, transactional data, tickets, resolve cases. That's, that's kind of the, the, the first toe in the water is starting to track anything. <laughs> Understanding that, that that's it's such a, a helpful piece is, is realizing if you've been tracking some things to this point, Adding in more feedback uh, isn't as as uh, intimidating or a daunting task, but again, it comes back to asking the right questions to get the right information back in from there. So, just want to kind of go through, read a couple more things here. Um, how do you share good feedback or respond? Do you need to respond? Boy, oh boy, there's a great thing we are going to talk about responding. Um, of course, you need to respond. Responding is kind of the most valuable piece of the feedback process. People give you their personal view on, on what it is you do for a living. And what you, what you have to understand is you, you owe it to them to come back and say, thank you for the feedback. And here's what we're going to do about it. Because hopefully enough people said it that you can really action that and say, gosh, that was some great feedback. We're going to use that. Thank you for that. If you have anything else, please let us know. And when we roll this out, let us know how it's going. That's uh, responding is absolutely critical. And if, even if you collect anonymous data, sending out a kind of an update monthly, quarterly, whatever it is in terms of how your cycle is for, for uh, uh, responding to feedback, that's absolutely critical. So some very good things here. Um, specific projects, happiness level, that's a, that, that's a good one. And we're gonna talk a bit about that. We talked about it uh, in yesterday's session about this net promoter score and how many people love you. Uh, there is a, um, a great book out there called Love Marks uh, that talks about is, is what you do a love mark to other people? Will they kind of crawl over <laughs> any other option to get to you because they really value what it is you do? So there's all sorts of great information out there on, on understanding that the more feedback you get, the more you can improve what it, what it is you do. And that just makes people uh, more and more inclined to helping you. So this is really, really great insight here. Um, but yeah, somebody also wrote, uh, you know, responding to all feedback helps show that uh, we care. And yes, that is, that is it. The idea here is again, to build that partnership, to show each other that you are both mutually engaged in what it is you do as the recipient of the service and the, the one delivering the service. So if you can kind of really align those two pieces, that is just great stuff. So if there's anything else that, that scribes have and they want to kind of throw it back into the, the chat feature, that would be great. Um, we'll obviously this, this will be downloaded by the service excellence team and they'll be able to kind of work backwards and kind of look at what, what's been said and hopefully kind of uh, help you with some of these other questions uh, as time evolves. So if scribes are still typing, I appreciate that. If there's anything else you want to add, please do so. We're gonna have another breakout later. So, you know, rest your typing fingers also and make sure you're ready to go for the next session as we, as we go along here. So let's talk about analyzing feedback. And I use this, uh, this conversation uh, far more often when we were actually in the office, when we were actually getting in the car and going to where it is you need to go. And some of you are still doing that, which is great. And I respect you for doing that. Uh, but for many of us, uh, we are working remotely and uh, um, that, is, uh, that is noble as well and the safe thing to do. But if you think about how do you analyze feedback, you, you, you've been doing it intuitively your whole life and realizing from where you live to where you go to work, um, 
you take a specific route and that route just didn't happen magically. Over time, you've learned, you know, this is the fastest route, this is the safest route, uh, this is the most dependable route, whatever it is, you've been able to look at a variety of data points, regardless of whatever your GPS told you or what Google Maps told you or whatever it is, that over time you started to kind of refine what it is you're doing based on new data points. So an understanding that when yesterday's snowstorm hit, obviously that, that alters things. You might take an alternate route based on the, the weather, based on the time of day. All those different factors come into what it is you do and you're always analyzing the data and refining your process based on that. What I want you to do as a, as a service team is to start looking at data you, you receive from your clients and analyzing it, not just looking at it at a moment in time, but continually evolving as you get more and more data, as you start to look at things over, you know, not just one day, but over a quarter or over a school year or whatever uh, duration or period you're looking at, that's where I think a lot of things are gonna be effective for you. The other side is understanding how often you pause look at your data. So understanding that, um, you know, traditionally you may have looked at this annually, you may have looked at this biannually, whatever it is that, uh, and I always encourage teams to not look at frequency, sorry, I'm not look at um, their data re results too frequently because if that's gonna overwhelm them. If, if your first couple of years, you only look at things annually, that's wonderful. But as you get better at this stuff, then you just can start to look at it, you know, weekly, monthly, uh, you know, by quarter, all those things I mentioned, whatever works best for you, understanding, you know, seasonally, depending on, on, on what it is your role is and, and understanding, are there, are there differences in what I see from a, a longer term view and are there peaks and values? And that's what, what kind of the, where the data analysis piece really starts to come in. So I'll scare you with all these sort of wonderful charts, whether they are kind of linear ex exponential trending lines, you can start to look at, are things getting better or worse? Are they accelerating? So, you know, those, those exponential uh, curves, are things starting to, to move at a much faster pace? Should we start to ramp up our, our, our capabilities in order to deliver things at a faster and faster clip? Um, you know, the bottom left shows you kind of seasonal trends. Can you watch things happen kind of over a, a kind of a rhythmic pattern? Understand you're going to have more demand at certain points of the year and less at others. And how does that help you structure, um, you know, how you deliver your service? So it's not this continuous line. There are going to be some times when you really need to ramp up your capability. And there are other times where you can rest, you know, retool and regroup for the next peak. And then obviously you look at, are there patterns? Are there things you can see that maybe don't happen seasonally, but things kind of ratchet up and then fall off and then ratchet up and then fall off. And you can start to anticipate those things. So if you are a manager or a team leader of these sorts of things, you can start to really see we're escalating, but there's gonna be a drop off. It happens every time. And when that happens, then we can catch our breath and start to climb back up the hill. So looking for trends in data is absolutely critical. And, and the more you can look at, um, you know, your data over time to find the appropriate trends, if there are any, any outliers, any anything of that nature, uh, the better off you're gonna be. That looks busy. I'll go back to that slide because that scares me even looking at it. There are all sorts of data points on here. And that's the kind of thing that this feedback uh, process can get into where all of a sudden there's just so much information, what do you do with it? And that's where I want you to really understand this idea of tracking only what matters. There are operational metrics you have to track regardless of where you're going. But the idea is if you have objectives that you're trying to establish, uh, trying to reach some, some targets you're trying to, to, uh, to obtain, then there are certain things you need to measure towards those things. You may know them as kind of choosing your smart objectives and measurables. That's sort of how the service excellence team has been framing them. So understanding, you know, what it is that we're, our objective setting is and how we're going to measure towards those objectives. But in the rest of the world, you know, there are other words that, that just kind of help sell it a bit more and they call them KPIs. And those are key performance indicators. So those smart objectives and measurables you've been working on, you know, hopefully those are the numerical measures that help you determine whether you're gonna meet your objectives or not. So whether you, 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 you track, you know, absenteeism of staff, but that doesn't help you, uh, you know, towards your objectives, don't link that to your objectives. Only link certain things that are important to you 
meeting your objectives of service excellence time and time again. So don't try to measure all things at all the time and, and, and keep them at the same weight or same level of importance. Just figure out what's important for you at the time to help you obtain, obtain and, and achieve your objectives. So these KPIs, these key performance indicators, you know, they may evolve over time. You may collect some data to identify some trends. And once you've identified those trends, you start to figure out, okay, now what are some, some of the measures we can start to really focus on that, can, that, that tie into those trends very nicely? And then we can measure those KPIs to decide, are we getting better at delivering our service? And that cycle continues over time. And as you identify new trends or trends start to fall off, you may be able to modify which KPIs or which uh, SMART goals and objectives, um, sorry, sorry, SMART objectives and measurables you use to ensure that your uh, service group is, is achieving what it, what it needs to. So I wanna look at this way from an example. You collect some feedback, you identify a trend, for example. In this case, I just chose multiple calls to resolve an issue. You know, it doesn't matter what the issue is, but if somebody has to call back five and six times to resolve an issue, that's not a great example of service excellence. So as the, you know, as that service team, you can sit back and say, this should be resolved in one call and one call only. So if somebody has to call back, we're not doing our job. So what we're going to do is we're going to tra start tracking calls per incident. So not just the volume of calls we get day in and day out, but understanding do, do people have to call back repeatedly? You know, this, this can impact the departments like accounting and IT and all those sorts of things where if people are calling back in about the same issue time and time again, there seems to be a, a link in the chain that might be broken. So once you start to measure calls per incident and you can track that over time, decide, is it getting better? Are the changes we put in place helping or hurting us? Then you can start to make your service delivery that much more effective. Then you collect some more feedback and, and see how it's going. And this again is a cycle that keeps happening. So as you start to get your feedback data, you find some key trends that are, that are popping up time and time again, that's when you can start to link those to some different measurables or KPIs uh, and help your team uh, kind of track how it's doing over time. But here's the problem. You get all this data, you got you know, spreadsheets and you've got videotapes and you've got anecdotal you know, references and diaries from people and snapshots and videos and whatever it is, all sorts of data coming in, oftentimes there is this thing that creeps in and it's called confirmation bias. So while the data itself may be objective, there might be something happening internally in terms of the people, <laughs> yourself included, your team, that may be sort of distorting how you, how you interpret the data. So one caution I have as you move more and more into this feedback process, this, this client feedback process is understanding that data tells you the whole picture. You just have to be looking for the whole picture. So understanding that there are gonna be some objective facts out there based on the feedback you receive. And then there's kind of what confirms what you want to believe. So you only see a piece of the story. And that can be a, a big challenge to overcome because you may have some deeply held beliefs about what your department offers, what your service team offers, and you know what what uh, people outside may think of you. So now all of a sudden you're getting this feedback back in that doesn't kind of conform to what it is you believe. So you sort of don't look at it as carefully. So what I want you to do is really be careful as you get your data, because confirmation bias is obviously not seeking out the objective facts. So you might not even be asking the tough enough questions to get the information you need. All right, when you get the information, you may not be interpreting it correctly. So you may be kind of looking at only the things that say you're amazing and forgetting all the things saying, if you just change these things, you would be amazing. So. This is a lot of work. This makes me pat myself on the back. So what I wanna do is, is really kind of look at the whole picture as you go along and not be biased one way or the other, or only as you recall how a project went, remembering the good parts of the project, not the, we went over budget or over time or didn't have the right horsepower in, 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 in how we did things. And remembering only, gosh, that looks fantastic now that it's done or everybody seems to have, you know, the the you know the, the deliverable that we've set out to achieve and forgetting all of the pitfalls and, and the roadblocks and the stumbling that might have happened and that costs time and cost energy and cost uh, funds and all sorts of things so that is something to keep in mind and obviously ignoring the information outright that challenges your beliefs 
So confirmation bias comes in uh, in, a, in a variety of different ways. And it does happen because uh, you know, averages lie. <laughs> you don't want to look at some of the things that, that may not be as comfortable to look at. And, 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 it, and there's all sorts of different causes of it. Obviously, there's mental models. I've used an abacus in accounting my whole life. So why would I switch to one of these pesky computers? You know, abacuses <laughs> are, are, are the future. They've always been here. They'll always be here. That's just a mental model you may have held up for a very long time. Uh, you may have your own individual motivations about saying, I don't, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm very good at it this way. I don't need to re uh, redevelop my, redesign my process. Uh, I'm doing a great job as it is. Uh, obviously, I've fallen into a routine. You know, I come into the office at a certain time and I leave at a certain time. And that may not be the best window to serve your clients. And just overlooking the fact that you just fall into a routine. It doesn't matter what time you show up uh, to you, but to them, it may matter. So understanding that, that, that your hours or your availability times, you know, or whatever it is that your routine has, uh, has caused you to behave within uh, may be a cause of cognitive bias. Understanding there's gonna be social pressure. You may be the, the super innovative um, ch you know, challenger in your group, but the rest of the group may not want that sort of uh, you know, upset, you know, no, don't rock the apple cart, those sorts of things. That can cause a lot of service teams to overlook things and, and, and see, it could be glaring, it could be the, the, with the proverbial elephant on the table and everyone's overlooking it. So understanding social pressure may cause a lot of this and obviously emotions. Um, it might be scary to all of a sudden move from one platform to another, to move from one building to another, regardless of whether it helps your clients or not. And that may cause you to overlook some of, of, of you know, some of the information telling you, please move from 50-50, you know, to, to tip it, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> the whole sorts of things are, are, are what causes a lot, of, a lot of service teams or organizations around the world to, to not live up to their, their true, true potential. Thankfully, there's this. I'm gonna call it the third opinion. Thankfully, there are people out there to help you. In this case, there is the service excellence team. There are gonna be acting as your coaches uh, over, uh, you know, the duration of, of, of your relationship in, in this program. So they have um, some good expertise and whether it's them or whether it's uh, the customers you treat, you, you, you've, you've developed these great partnership relationships with, um, having an external opinion is going to be very helpful because you as a service group at the center of the world may be subject matter experts. You may know your, your uh, offering better than anybody on the planet, but that's just in your sphere, only in what you see. Whereas, you know, your client has to take what you offer and put into a broader uh, context of what it is they do. And that gives them a bit more understanding of how things could be modified to help them and ultimately help you. But at the outside of this, with the greatest uh, knowledge base or, or perspective on the system, be able to look across the entire board uh, are your, or in this case, maybe your coaches or, or people that kind of see across just you, not just your function, but see across all function, understand how things work upstream and downstream and can really help you look through your data far more objectively and, and make the change that is gonna be the most meaningful for you and your service team over time. So these third opinions can come in all sorts of different conversations. I mean, it can, can open up all sorts of different conversations. You can have these visionary conversations. You can look at what is the magic of the future? Where are we going to go? How are we going to really revolutionize our function over time? These are the people you can have those, those great conversations with. You can have the sounding board relationship with them. You can have them look through your data and be brutally honest about what they think it says. Like I said uh, in the last slide, these people can help you have a big picture conversation. They can look at zooming out of what it is your service team does and how it, uh, how the, how it fits into the, the, the broader machine that is the TDSB. And ultimately, these are people that may bring experience into your group that you don't otherwise have. So there may be some good day-to-day um, you know, -day operational skill sets within your group, but not enough program and, pro and project management skill sets these people can help you move from point A to point B. So whether they are your coaches for the, for the service excellence team, or like I said, great customers um, or mentors you have within the board, those are people that can help you have these great conversations and look through your data far more objectively. So I encourage you to really, really strongly engage these uh, uh, 
um, these third opinions. There's, there's, the, there's your client, there's you, and then there's somebody else that sits outside of your space that can really uh, kind of hold up a mirror a little more effectively and let you see what, what people are saying about what it is you're offering. So let's talk about this confirmation bias. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you back out into your breakout rooms. So I'm hoping everybody accepts this time and gets out. We're going to have another 15 minute chat. I'm hoping that the scribes are ready to type, but we're going to talk about confirmation bias. And we're going to ask, I'm asking you is how do you plan on ensuring your feedback process does not fall into the trap or trap of confirmation bias? Because it's going to happen and you have to address it early on in the process and be brave enough to uh, address it early on in the process. So I will send that information back out to you in the breakout groups, but first and foremost, get ready to head back out everybody. And I'm gonna open the rooms back up and I'll talk to you in about 15 minutes. Wow, this is what I wanna see. So all the scribes, I'm hoping you guys can put some great information back in here. Um, yeah, not have uh, yeah, neutral, no neutral options. We did talk about that yesterday, just I think you're using yesterday's learnings in today's class, which is a good thing, no neutral options force people one way or the other, positive responses, negative responses, stay away from neutral whenever possible. Um, collect measurable facts for sure, get specific analysis on the department. Exactly, ask, ask those tough questions. I think that's one of the bigger things is ask questions that there's no real room to hide in them. You're going to get the feedback you need as, as you go along here. So that, that's a, ma a major thing. Um, uh, Maddie, some great things. Um, the one thing I will say is, is uh, many, many years ago when I started this uh, sort of thing, people were just getting into the concept of the, of the devil's advocate. And the devil's advocate is good to a point. Um, it, it, it takes confirmation bias and goes all the way to the other side sometimes. And, and that's where you have to be careful with the confirmation, with the, sorry, the devil's advocate, because you can always knock something down. So understand that uh, you know, to a point, the devil's advocate is good. Somebody that just sits back and their job is to, is to pretend they don't work there and objectively look at what's up on the board and say, gosh, that's wrong. Here's what we need to do and play the, the, the terrible what if games and all those sorts of things. But be careful you don't take it too far. It's all, all I'm saying is the devil's advocate can go on and on and on and take a great idea and crush it. <laughs> and so just be careful when you appoint that person that you don't give them unlimited power. And they understand the goal is to just uh, pressure test something, not poke a million holes in it and ruin it. And if you can kind of find that balance, the devil's advocate is a great, a great tool to use. So that, that's a wonderful thing here. Um, provide opportunity to give uh, comments, suggestions on how we can improve. That's a great way. And, and we did talk a bit, about, about, a bit about it yesterday is that you can have some great qualitative data. So asking agree, disagree type questions, but also giving kind of a, a check and balance by having verbatim comments. So having the ability to say, you've, asked, you've, you've answered these five or six questions or 10 or 12 or whatever you've chosen, please give us some context. We'd love some context, good or bad. And that way you can check that back against the data and realize if somebody's willing to actually type out a response, boy, oh boy, that's where magic happens because then you get some context, you get some, you can kind of get the flavor is the word I like to use. So you can get the idea of, you know, what emotion is in, in the background there. Is it a high level of frustration or a low level of frustration? Those sorts of things. So, so adding in is kind of that check and balance of, 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 of qualitative and quantitative data is, is, is very, very important for sure. Um, but yeah, some great things. I'm hoping some of the other groups would come back in with their, their chat type uh, comments, which is a great thing. Probing questions are unbelievably good. Um, you know, and, and that's, a, that's another thing we're going to talk about in a second, but asking kind of the, the follow-up question. So it's wonderful you told us about X. Now we have three follow-up questions on that concept. And that's where I think you can dig a little bit deeper and, and get in close, uh, you know, escape hatches around along the way. Um, so just really understand that those are some very, very um, uh, critical things. And obviously, the, uh, George, you wrote some great thing around uh, reviewing data with an external non-partial individual. That is the third opinion. That's what you're looking for. So whether it's your coach, hopefully it's your coach. And, and that's where, you, again, you build that level of trust that they become more of a trusted advisor, not just a, um, you know, a, you know, somebody that, that, that 
hops into your meeting once every every three months somebody that, that honestly has a vested interest in what you do and i understand obviously the circuit service excellence team has that um going for them but the idea i really want people to understand is that um you know make sure you have somebody that that can can be honest with you can can understand uh, what it is you're struggling with, what it is you do very well, and kind of help you close the gap and, and, and shore up some of your, your shortcomings, if there are any. So some great things in here. I really do hope that uh, you know, if there are some other people that can kind of come back in, because we did have 10 groups. I'm hoping that some of the conversation did happen there. Please do take an opportunity to, to fill out the, the forms uh, into the chat when, when you're ready. Um, but what I'm going to do is head back into uh, the slides and kind of make sure we understand a bit more. So we've talked a bit about this confirmation bias. And what I want to do is make sure we can go on to the last section. So we're going to have another 15, 20 minutes of chat here, and then we're going to go on to some Q&A at the end. So if you want to put your questions, at, even starting now or whenever, into the chat feature as well. So we, when we get to that Q&A piece, uh, I can answer them, or, or the Service Excellence team and I can answer them as we, as we go through this. So the last piece, we've talked about initiating feedback and kind of going out and looking for it and, and, and finding different tools to get information back in. Then we talked about once you have that information, how do you analyze it? And once you start to analyze your data, you, it becomes apparent that there are some, some key pockets and sort of key individuals you wanna deal with. So that's why I wanna talk and kind of wrap up today about targeting feedback. So looking at not just a blanket that you throw over the entire board, but starting to look at different pockets within the board to see how things work. And I'm always a, a big fan of the more you measure, the better off you're gonna be. And that's, um, and, I, and I'll tell you, don't take that lightly. I honestly encourage uh, my client groups to really uh, find different ways of getting feedback in and, and every time you do something there's a there's a, a feedback moment that can that can happen there and that can test right out of the gate is this working or not so understanding you're going to do a little prototyping and send it out to a certain piece measure it see how it's going to do and move on from there all right there's all sorts of drivers to help you kind of get into the the mindset of asking questions to smaller groups at different times about different things. So whether it's seasonal things, obviously September, a lot of the challenges are different than June. And, and that, that's just gonna happen. If there are projects that are being launched, software updates, changes in leadership, which you know just happened, you know, rollouts of, of new initiatives or projects, changes in obviously federal provincial legislation and obviously reorganization within departments. All of these sorts of things are great opportunities to get feedback so that you can make your offering that much more effective. So looking for different ways around you and, and different kind of moments in time um, will make your ability to collect great feedback and ultimately deliver better service um, uh, you know, that much more effective. One thing that I want you to start doing is realizing, sure, you uh, service the entire board, which is wonderful, but there are some key people you can be looking for and you wanna kind of identify these targeted candidates, looking at, we kind of kind of start to understand who our who our um, most our greatest influencers are, people who really kind of can help us, and we can feedback provide get feedback from just those people. We're going to be so much better off. And a lot of organizations um, are moving to this idea of developing client personas, and it's a, kind of an easy way of kind of saying, "Gosh, I don't want to see you know you know the thousands of people that I deal with. Who are the three or four kind of." people that I deal with, our heavy users, our, our newbies into what it is we do, um, the people that are, you know, are going rogue more often, for example, and giving us more information and, and, and tasking us with changing it is uh, what it is how we do. So this might be something to consider is to, is to start deciding who are the, the, the key personas that deal with us on a daily basis and how can we start to develop feedback tools to address their needs? So looking at who they are, and, and a lot of organizations give these people names and start to build up who they are, but that helps you target more effectively to say, gosh, of the 100 calls we get a month, um, these are the people we deal with. Like this is, this is, you know, this is Joan and this is, this is what she likes. This is how her day is. She shows up at school early. She leaves right at the, at the end of the day. You know, her pain points are the fact that she's so far from the copier that it's a problem. You know, she uses all the cool lingo that, you know, teachers would use like IEPs, whatever those are. Um, and, and realizing who she interacts with in the school. And, and once you start to understand kind of who those people are, um, 
you can start to build feedback tools to, to kind of get to the root cause of what they need from you and how your service group can offer things. So that's one thing I want you to keep in mind when you're talking about targeting. The other side is that, is that a lot of people see kind of a question set of a survey and figure this goes to all people at all times. You know, when we sit down at the end of a meeting and we have a conversation, I, I ask the same three questions to everybody, regardless of whether those questions are actually relevant to them. So there's a whole idea around kind of question routing. And it's like a choose your own adventure. At the end of the first question, you decide are you going this way or that way? And here's an example I, I found that I think works really well. You know, here's a, an example that do you commute to work? Two options, yes or no. And realizing based on how you answer that, if you answered, yes, I do, you know, you can start to ask some more questions and you can say, how do you get to work? What means of transport do you use? You know, how often do you use the, these various means of transportation? But on the other side, if you say no, that's great. You can say thanks, but you're not who we're looking for right now. So have a great day. We're not going to ask you any more questions. So that's a great way of targeting when you don't necessarily know who your personas are out there. And you can ask a question and immediately say, listen, I don't want to bother you anymore because you're not going to give us the feedback we need right now. And that's okay. So start to look at targeting in that respect that it's that follow up question. If you ask a question and you get an answer, it can lead to a different set of possibilities. So that's a great way of looking at a number of these things. Here's another thing that, that I, I find very interesting. And again, uh, this, is, this is something that a lot of people, uh, you know, at first don't see the potential when it comes to dealing with uh, collecting feedback. And that, that's looking at kind of regional analysis. And thankfully the TDSB is a monster board and there are great opportunities to kind of slice and dice across the city to decide who do we want to talk to and when. So I'll start here. No, this is not Toronto. <laughs> this is Arizona. And, you know, the more, you know, we, I think that the election in the, in the U.S. is over, we believe it might be. But while the, the, the data was coming in, there was um, uh, CNN with their, with their magic board and, and everyone was just constantly going deeper and deeper into data. And that reminded me how impactful it is to look at populations in different ways. So this is the great state of Arizona. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. And realizing that this is how the votes came in for this particular election. So realizing right out of the gate, you can look at the different counties, the different electoral regions and realizing right out of the gate, gosh, there are so many different things happening within this population. And if we start to look at things a little differently, we might get some different levels of feedback. So taking the, the, the broad strokes of your data and breaking it down by different demographics can be very, very effective. Understanding that these are the various electoral regions that went one way or the other over the course of this, this election. And you can kind of overlap that with um, kind of the first map, but I find this one very fascinating. Here are the indigenous regions in Arizona and looking at how they mapped out almost to the T with that first uh, breakout of the red and blue uh, difference between Democrat and Republican and showing, gosh, maybe there's something we can glean from looking at those different populations and their needs. And it's about understanding different populations require different things from your group. And you start to go, gosh, feedback becomes so much more important. And then you can look at what are the levels in, of population. So this last uh, iteration shows how many people live in these various parts of, of the state. So you say, oh my goodness, there are very few in this area, but look at the, the, the monster sizes around Tucson and Phoenix. And you think, gosh, that's a different thing to look at. The, the population may require that much more. We might look at why we get so many calls from that particular region in the city. Well, there might be a very, this may be a very densely populated region. And, and that's kind of where um, looking at feedback and targeting feedback and, and using your resources effectively can lead to some really great outcomes when it comes to feedback. This is Toronto. This is what we want to talk about. Understanding there's so many great opportunities here. This is how the TDSB sees the world. Understanding these are all of the various uh, schools across the school, the, the, across the network. You look at, are there things you can glean just by looking at this? Or is there a different way of looking at it? Maybe you want to look at it by just 22 different things, as opposed to 300 plus things we used to look at. And, and realizing maybe one year you look deeper at the uh, the even wards versus the odd wards and, and understanding maybe there are some differences here in the north versus the south or the east versus the west. And the more you start to segment these sorts of things, you can look at, are we getting calls from 
more calls from different uh, areas of the city than others. And maybe that can give us some insight into how we deliver our services across the board. Or we can look at it by so many different uh, slices of the, the population and, and how things uh, are, are, are laid out across the city. So this is uh, out of a report the TDSB published of maybe, I don't know, 50 <laughs> different maps like this and looking at how thin sliced the data is that's out there already that you might be able to look at some of this and, and glean some great insight that will help you in your service excellence journey over time. So don't see the city in one way, maybe you can see it in a variety of different formats and that will allow you to deliver your service the most effectively to the most people and, and ultimately make your, your, your offering successful from, uh, from one end of the city to the other. Other targets you can consider, like I said, we talked about your heavy users, who are people that call you every day, not just because they can't figure things out necessarily, but they really like engaging with you. Maybe you can figure out why do they call you? What benefit do you provide to them that you maybe you can get to, uh, to more people to engage with you around? You know, like why are some groups more engaged with your department or your service group than others? Why are the people not responding to your to your surveys or, or requests for feedback? Maybe those are people you can sit down with over a Zoom call and figure out why do they not see the value in what it is you do? Look at the people who give you the most complaints, you're least satisfied or uh, divvy things up by facility age. Do new schools, newly built schools versus uh, original schools, do they have different needs from you? And obviously the size of the school could be another major factor from a hundred persons, hundred student school to a 900 student school. I'm sure there are gonna be some differences along those lines. So when we talk about targeting, think about it in so many different ways you're going to get some great insight to help you as you go along. By slicing and dicing, you might uncover some things called blind spots. And I want to sort of wrap up around this concept of blind spots, understanding that you're going to get some feedback. And I saw some of the feed, some of the chat uh, discussion today and yesterday talking about we get information we didn't know. <laughs> and that's the benefit to taking these the step to, to move towards more and more feedback. So understanding that the chance you're going to see a blind spot <laughs> on your own is very, very little. Um, but the more you ask, the more people, uh, the more likely it is that you'll be able to uncover some gaps in your service delivery or some hidden potential that's out there to make you even better than you are day to day. And understanding like this is another major uh, understanding of, of how to look at blind spots or realizing what do you know about yourself versus what do other people know about you? So this is where, again, if you're trying to operate in a vacuum where people are, you're just assuming people love you and you're not doing any feedback and nothing's changed in 20 years. But meanwhile, outside of where your office is and all the people that are your end users, they are complaining, they're frustrated, they don't know what to do, they're going rogue that may be where this feedback will help you close some of these gaps. So there are things that are known to you, there are known to other people, and what you're looking for are things that are known to other people and not necessarily known to yourself. And if you get even better at asking questions, uh, you can help unlock some of this hidden potential, like I talked about, underutilized assets in your, in your service group. Um, or if you can really get good at this sort of thing, you can look at where, are our, where can we possibly go working into that space that is unknown. And my goodness, that's where some really exciting things can happen. So this feedback tool can really, like employing this process can really help you uncover some of the blind spots you may have about how your service is, is being delivered and hasn't been delivered for a very long time. So keep that in mind. And these blind spots come in a variety of different ways. There are some strategic blind spots, like we're just going the wrong direction from the get-go. And my goodness, we had no idea. Uh, there are some behavioral blind spots. We don't answer the phone in a courteous manner or, you know, we don't respect the neighbors when we show up with our trucks or, or any number of different behavioral issues. Um, you know, the, the, the culture of your service group may be something that is impacting your end users. And at the end of the day, there might be some process issues that, that get unlocked by doing these sorts of feedback tool, uh, employing some of these feedback tools so that you can really understand, gosh, we're, we're taking too long or we're moving too quickly or whatever it is by getting feedback from people around you, by targeting it and looking and uncovering some blind spots, you can really can get some very uh, effective information going forward. So you've got all this great data. You've been doing focus groups, you've been doing surveys, you've been doing observational analysis. How do you get it all together? So the last thing I wanna wrap up with today is kind of now, how do you compile all of this information? Because you, you've gone from one tool 
that you ask to everybody to maybe some more smaller pockets of, of, of feedback mechanisms that impact uh, you know, different people at different times. How do you pull this all together? And here's the scenario I've come up with. You've, you've, you've collected data from an email survey, you have did a Zoom focus group, and you've taken some observational notes about wandering through a school or a, a, a series of schools to really get a sense on how it is, what you offer is, is, is the uptake level and, and the, the engagement level of people uh, and at the ground level uh, doing their day-to-day -day within the schools. Well, one option right out of the gate is to start bucketing different pieces of data into these five Cs. Are we getting, you know, are these compliments we're getting? Are these complaints we're getting? Are these just comments? And, and once you start to kind of realize you can over, you can take qualitative and quantitative information and put it into these five buckets, that's a very, very cool start. Furthermore, some people love Excel. And by all means, <laughs> create spreadsheets and try to create columns and, and, and factors that allow you to overlay different data sets to get an idea of what people are really saying about you, your service offering uh, and your service team over time. And this is where you start to kind of unlock the, the, the data and sort of really pull things together. Um, I talked about this yesterday and I'll, I'll bring it up again today. Uh, if you use a lot of uh, verbatim comments or you take a lot of notes about observational analysis, there's a lot of great software out there uh, that allows you to kind of generate these word clouds. So it picks out the key words that are used most frequently and seem to be most relevant to people's needs. So by all means, use this sort of tool. Uh, if you want to get really basic to start off with, just choose an effective category. Does it make people happy? <laughs> Does it make people sad? Is it just sort of neutral? And, and just by moving to these three levels, you'll get some really good insight as to are we doing the right thing or are there areas that we can improve? And this also will give you a better sense on what your overall net promoter score would be in terms of the people that are really uh, engaged with you uh, versus the people who are very dissatisfied with you. And, and, and just by separating things into these buckets and just giving it a, a green, a red, or a blue, or a yellow, whatever color code you want to use, by all means, do it. Um, we all love our, our true crime stories. Here's another really interesting way. If you have photos, if you have data, if you have maps, if you have all sorts of visual information, act like a cop show, become a detective, put all, all of that, that information up on a board and get your yarn out and start to kind of get to the bottom of things and, 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 and ultimately catch the culprit in, in your service team. And that's, that's kind of a really, really important uh, factor when uh, you're, you're trying to compile all these data, these data points is to understand, you know, you don't want them to sit in silos themselves, you want to kind of pull all this sort of information together and, and the better you are at kind of sifting through the, all this information, the clearer picture you're going to have on how it is your service team is, is delivering things. So that's some pretty interesting things. Given that we've gone through all sorts of great information, um, what I want to do now is kind of change uh, gears and let you ask some questions back to me. I want to get some feedback. I want to get some understanding of what it is you're doing. So I want to shift gears to a bit of a Q&A. So if you have any questions for me, please uh, feel free to put them into the, uh, um, the, the, the chat feature. And oh, Arlene is back and we're ready now. Here we go, Arlene. Fantastic news. So by all means, uh, if you have questions for me, Arlene, any, any questions from you? Anything that uh, piqued your interest there? No, I think um, one of the messages that really resonated with me is the, uh, well, a couple of them, the third opinion. And so you've done a great job of integrating service excellence into the session and encouraging people uh, to reach out to myself, Erin, and Sarita. So I just want to, again, let everyone know that we're fully on board with continuing this learning uh, once you're back on the job. And we had some teams actually uh, in our last cycle, reach out to us first for that third opinion uh, to get um, a second lens on some of the questions they were drafting, uh, to be able to tell them if there were any gaps, you know, in those questions, and also to just, again, share some ideas on some different ways to target feedback. So it was great to hear uh, that um, highlighted in the session, and then certainly all the learning around bias. Uh, is one of those areas which is reflected in our unit team worksheet under equity. So again, mm -hmm. great to see that, uh, you know, that joining of bias and equity and making sure, right, that we're not missing voices. That's one of the messages that we're always bringing out to our team. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear how that is uh, a key area that teams have to be aware of 
And again, getting that third opinion can certainly help, right, in mitigating any of the biases that may exist in your team. So I wanted to encourage um, uh, people out there that if there were issues raised in your breakout room discussions uh, that Kyle was not able to respond to when he did the debriefing, that now's a good time. You can bring those issues back into the Q&A and Kyle will certainly um, take some time now to address those. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm, I don't think that the flurry of information coming in here. So- uh, <laughs> Oh, we got one. <laughs> Oh boy, and that, that's, I think that came up yesterday is, is the no news is good news. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of organizations, um, yeah, they, they, they figure if, if nobody's saying anything, um, everything's all right. And, and, and that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. And, and you know, it's, it's when you've lost people, they, they've, they've given up hope of even contacting you anymore. And, and that's, that's, that's the saddest thing. And it happens between bosses and subordinates, but also happens between organizations and their clients, um, understanding that if, that if they start to feel helpless and they feel that are hopeless and they, they try to reach out to a group or they, they don't kind of get the help they need, they just stop engaging with you. And, and so the, the no news, um, you know, there's a potential that you're doing a great job, but it's, the, it's also to not stand on a plateau is to move to the next level and keep uh, upping your game because new technology is going to come in. Uh, needs are going to change uh, this year, for example, uh, things are going to come out of, out of left field and you have to be prepared to handle them. So uh, a lot of organizations see that no news is good news and, um, and they only respond when frustrated. And, and that's, that's a really key point. And, and I and Claire, thank you for bringing that up because um, people only think that these feedback tools are, are negative, that they're just, oh, people, it's just a complaint hotline. And, 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 and that's, that's only if you don't show the value of some great um, uh, constructive feedback, some, some, some compliments that they're deserved. And so, so encouraging people to, to reach out to you with good, bad, and ugly is, is, is a, a sign of strength for sure. Kyle, actually, one of the things that I'd, I'd like you to um, maybe touch on a, a little bit more, just because we recognize that it's a, a data area that's a bit more challenging is for teams that aren't necessarily measuring in hard metrics. Right, okay. so it would be more uh, like let you know they're they're not um, it's not any sort of technical uh, output, and so we often talk about capturing qualitative data, right? Mm -hmm. But could you um, help us understand or maybe give some examples of of what that actually looks like when you don't have the sort of hard measurables that some teams you know might be easier mm -hmm. for them to capture. Yeah, no, and that, that's, that's a very good point because, you know, a lot of people think that feedback is only surveys. It's, it's like, ask 10 questions, ask 10 questions, ask 10 questions. And sure, that has a place, but there's so many other things that I tried to highlight at the beginning around observational and diaries and those sorts of things. And um, a long time ago, I, was, I, I learned the, the three T's, tone, texture, and timing. And so when you're, when you're getting kind of more qualitative feedback, you're talking to people or they're they're sending you an email offhand or you're having a zoom conversation with them look for how are they what is the tone are they are they are they, are they agitated are they um are they so so their their eyes are glowing so there's a lot of body language you have to read um what is the texture are they are they using profanity on the phone are they are they, are they that aggressive with things or are they using wonderful adjectives to describe what it is you're talking about or and then the timing just back to back to Claire's point, are they only calling when things are bad? And and so understanding that you can you can start to kind of track those things. Like I had a call with somebody, you know, the call was overall positive. The call was, you know, uh, about this issue. And you, you can start to kind of take softer things and say, listen, uh, they were engaged, they were trying to be helpful. And, and, and that's where you can you can start to uh, track uh, without asking a yes or no type question. If that makes sense. Great. I love that tone, texture, timing. As the coaches, we're definitely going to take that one on board. Okay. So make notes. <laughs> there you go. There, Mr. T. Um, list for facts, feelings, and values. See, like, look at that, Sarita. Good job. Um, but that's, it's, whatever, 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 <laughs> three or four or five or six things, start to decide 
again, I go back to my slide on kind of what effective group do you want to put this under? At the end of the day, you pick, put that on the phone call and say, was that a happy call, a sad call, or a neutral call? And just, just track that. Are we getting a lot of happy calls? Are we getting a lot of sad calls? And, and that's, that's the, the easiest way to start really tracking some of these things and sit back and have your, have your team kind of understand, I want it to be, you know, like, like just, just don't worry about how many words they use. Don't worry about how long you're on the phone with them. Talk about it. at the end of the day, are they happy? Are they sad? And they hang up the phone and that's it. And, and you can, you can make a lot of progress that way. Great. And there's so, so. one other thing that I, I think would be helpful for people who didn't attend yesterday's session is if you can just touch on this uh, idea of um, client uh, burnout from too much feedback, this perception <laughs> that because we all work for one organization and our primary clients are schools and we're clients of one another, there's this, there's this uh, sense out there that perhaps um, we might be over uh, feedbacking. I think I just rate, <laughs> made that up as a verb, but that, that, it's, 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 I, know, I, I, we're feedbacking yeah. feedback from the same sure. groups of clients. Well, let me ask you, what, what is the employee headcount of the TDSB? So I think it's just under 40,000. There's a lot of sorry, it. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> right. If you look at that in terms of a metric for starters, understanding that you have 40,000 people across the board. So understanding burnout at that level, you have to be asking 40,000 people every single day times 70 service units. right out of the gate. That's just not feasible and that's not going to happen. So understanding that, you know, HR may only deal with, you know, only new recruits for most of their, their time. Everyone, once people are through, they, they don't, they, they barely need to engage HR anymore or whatever it is, there is not going to be burnout and, and understanding um, a, there's a huge population of people B, um, I, and I, I said, again, this is what I talked about yesterday is that if you can build the case for them engaging with you on a feedback basis, you show them the value. So you, you say, okay, uh, I'm going to ask you questions. You're going to provide me feedback. I'm going to make things awesome. <laughs> you know, next time you ask for feedback, oh, sorry. And then you actually do make things awesome. The next time you ask them a question or somebody else says, I'm going to make our stuff awesome too. You go, oh, well, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide feedback because there's, 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 there's a benefit to me, the end user, and ultimately to the service group as well. So it goes back to that partnership angle that um, the fear is we're gonna be sending emails out thousands and thousands and thousands of emails that go back to the participation rate. Right at the gate, you're not gonna get everybody all the time, but also understand that if you can build the value, uh, perceived value for the end user to giving you that feedback, they will take an hour out of their day to, to uh, and, they, and they deal with you often, and they will be more than happy to give you feedback. You know, they, they, they give the, again, it goes back to that res respect and if they respect you enough and you're giving them permission and it's, and it's, and it, and it works, <laughs> of course, they're going to, they're going to give you uh, the feedback as, as often as you want it. I, I will, I'll, I'll say that because I, I know it. I know it for sure. I'm the kind of guy who comes out of the supermarket and they have that little box that yes. was the, like, you press the <laughs> buttons every time. I want to press the button because I know where that data goes. I understand how valuable it is. And I'm happy to give, I'm happy to press the red button just as happy as I am to press the green button because, you know, I spent a lot of my time working on employee experience and customer experience. So I, like, I didn't have fun this time, red button, <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, I know hopefully that's going to change things. That's important. I, it's, it's very I, important. Thank you so much, Kyle. I just want to add to that because uh, I would say, you know, almost 100% of our teams are just starting their client feedback journey, um, that uh, teams don't have to worry about feedback fatigue because uh, as Kyle is saying, our clients are, are uh, probably waiting for us to reach out and give them a voice in uh, the services that are impacting them. So uh, I think it would be a, a long time coming for clients uh, at the TDSB to, to get to a point of feedback fatigue. So I just, yeah. I, I like how you framed it. And I really don't think that's a, uh, something that we have to worry about when uh, we're putting feedback out there. So I see that yeah. a couple of questions have come in. Yeah, no, and, and one came in that is, that is so important, Arlene. I was about to cut you off and just hit the mute on your mic and be like, listen, <laughs> I have to address this one. Um, incentivizing feedback never you know like oh fill out the survey and you get a free ipad um that boy oh boy oh boy 
um, do not um, monetize or incentivize uh, that is that is extrinsic, not like intrinsic monet uh, um, intrinsic um, incentivizing, i.e. this is good for you, this is good for us, everybody wins. That's great. But, but the second you put a Tim card or uh, a raffle or all those sorts of things in front of your feedback, you're going to get biased because people are going to think, oh, if I give negative feedback, I'm not going to get the Tim card or, or those sorts of things. So what I, I definitely say is do not uh, offer any sort of reward aside from your life is going to be better, our life is going to be better. Um, but the other side is if people are not giving you feedback, no matter what you do, choose another feedback tool. There are so many of them out there. You know, and I always say like, correct me, Arlene, what is the admission for a TDSB staff to walk into a school, assuming COVID's not on? What does it cost again? Pretty sure it's still free. It's still free. So I, I always say like, you know what? And everyone look down at your desk right now, or your, your chair and decide, are you literally chained to that chair? You're not, okay? <laughs> you can get up, call your boss and say, listen, I wanna see these three schools today. I wanna go and talk to people who have used our stuff and I'm gonna send them an email. I'm gonna, oh, this is obviously post COVID. You can FaceTime or whatever it is in the meantime. But if they're not answering your survey and you need that feedback desperately, get up, drive over, go talk to them, uh, you know, <laughs> or find somebody who can, whatever, whatever it is, you choose another tool. And, and I'm just saying there's so many different ones out there, different people, different timings, um, you know, just don't stop at the first one just because it doesn't work, you know, use what's right for you. And we talked about this yesterday, use a tool that works for you. If you don't have the ability to do a survey, then like Arlene alluded to, don't use a survey, use a phone. Use in, use face to face. Use focus focus groups. Whatever. Use the QR code. Like we talked about, like posting QR codes and, and saying, "Listen, if you like what we did or you want to give us feedback, uh, hover over this QR code and and it'll pop up our email or our phone number, and you can you can deal with us immediately uh, that way." So that is a good one for sure. I am a small technical department. We do not deal with 40k users. Uh, Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm saying, yeah, you're going to like, you know, you also have to understand that that 40,000 people, um, you don't need 40,000 data points. So, you know, you know, 10, seven, five is better than the zero you had last year and build it up over time. So, so when people are saying, you know, you would deal with all people, they may not have any, any need to interact with you. And that's okay as well. You're looking for people that, that want to help, want to provide feedback. If things are going fine, that's great. But if, if you have specific questions, then you can reach out to, to all 40,000 people when you need to. So that is that. I've been getting some, some very good questions. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure there are thousands of others. So uh, Arlene, I'm sure that the second we press the red button and this is over, people go, oh, I should have asked that question. So I will encourage everybody, please uh, reach out to Arlene and, uh, and, and give her the, your questions because that's what they're here to do, help you with these sorts of things. All right, so before you cut me off, watch this. Hey, Arlene, do you want to talk about the, the feedback form at the end of this? <laughs> I think it's that magical time, Kyle, where we're actually ready to wrap up a few minutes early. So that's always a nice little bonus. Uh, so thank you so much, Kyle, um, for both sessions. Uh, the insights shared today, shared yesterday, are really helping us to leapfrog forward in terms of our understanding, of client feedback, the value, you know, why this is so important, but some really uh, concrete ways now of framing that client feedback work, both for teams who are just getting started. So yesterday's session was really a, a sort of foundational. Uh, and for those of you who uh, did not attend that, you'll also have access to that recording. And for today, taking those insights deeper and really helping teams to progress their feedback work in a way that's meaningful and ultimately will have a positive impact on clients, which is, you know, really the overarching point of client feedback, right? So Who knew, yeah. it's really been fantastic. Uh, we've spent a couple months working with you uh, to pull all this together. So uh, it's really awesome to see how um, all of this learning uh, has been able to uh, be shared with everyone attended. Excellent. We want to thank our participants. We know, again, uh, times are very busy. So taking time out today to be able to attend. For those of you who attended both, 
uh, double the learning, double the time. Again, very much appreciated. And for anything that you'd like to take forward from this, as Kyle has been um, saying, you now have uh, your coaches, myself, Aaron, and Sarita, please reach out to us. Uh, uh, we wanna make sure that we support your client feedback going forward. And as always in the spirit of feedback, uh, our service excellence team would love to hear from you. There is a link to a feedback form now in the chat. So please, we encourage you, we'd like to continue offering uh, spotlight sessions with subject matter experts, champions uh, like Kyle going forward. So your feedback is really important to make sure that we're on track with any future learning and as well, um, uh, any thoughts or feedback you'd like, like to share today. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks again so much, Kyle. I can see that you are in the holiday spirit. Hopefully there will be some gifts under that tree <laughs> on that special day. Nothing yet, um, nothing yet, working on it. Yeah, well, you got you got a couple of weeks still. So, so everyone, thank you so much again. Uh, have a great day and we look forward to connecting with you in the future. That's great, thanks everybody. Please stay safe and uh, enjoy the rest of the fiscal year. Bye for now.